Welcome back, everybody, to our seventh and final Open Textbook Network Pub 101 meeting. But remember, it doesn't have to be goodbye. It is merely a fork in the road as we continue on with OER publishing. So last week, you may remember that we talked about publishing options and pathways, and we heard from Elvis and Mike at Scribe about how they do things there and how the publishing industry in general approaches editing, proofreading, and other services. And this week, we're going to continue on our chronological journey and learn more about what to do once you finish a project, once the OER is published. But before I turn things over to our very special guest, Amy Hoffer, I would like to spend a few minutes reflecting on our time together. Now, you may or may not recall that when we started on April 15th, you added your name to our shared class notes, which I'm putting in the link now in case you don't have it open and want to access it. Um, please go there, and I'm going to give you two minutes. You wrote down your reason for joining Pub 101, and so if you could just dig up that reason and um, revisit it, and then take a moment to think, hmm, how did it go? Did I meet my goals? Did I get what I thought I would get out of Pub 101? Is there more? Please take a moment to find your reason for joining and then um, unmute or put something in the chat about, hey, I thought this would be something else, but I gained these other skills or fill in the blank. Anyone find their reason? It's not helpfully alphabetized, so there's some searching. <laughs> Diana, you wanted to learn more and you did. Awesome. Susan, learn more about the OER publishing process. I learned this and so much more. That's great to hear. Lisa, learn there's a lot to know and we aren't quite there yet, but um have lots of ideas after this experience joshua gained more co cohesive understanding of the oer process as a whole which helped me understand how my individual role contributes and fits in that's awesome um, i think having that kind of clarity before you start is ideal it doesn't always um, happen but that's great our amy was saying uh, provide additional publishing support was my goal and i think i have a better knowledge base of how to meet it super Aaron's starting point, last year we did a mini grant to incentivize adoption of OER, but I wanna start doing more in terms of encouraging creation of OER. Not sure if I learned exactly what I expected at the beginning, but I did learn a ton. Um, that's helpful to know what else um, we can cover in future co-op sessions or future Pub 101 sessions, so thank you, Aaron. Katie wanted to learn more and did. Uh, Julie said, reading through the Pub 101 modules, coming to these classes has helped gain perspective on the moving parts of our OER program, as well as accessibility and universal design, and there are great resources here. Julie, I appreciate hearing that. I know there's so many great OER resources out there in the world produced by many different librarians, practitioners, organizations, and sometimes it's hard to, you know, dig it up and do any kind of self-guided study. So part of the goal in setting aside time together in Pub 101 for an orientation is to provide that kind of structure um, to reveal those resources and sort of guide you through them so that um, you know where they are when you need them later and you're actually um, working on a project or a program. A few more. Corey learned what I was hoping to, but also really learned about the importance of communication and the expectations with faculty. Laura has a lot of things to think about, like workflows and MOUs, which has been helpful. Um, Katie also has been thinking about MOUs and zooming in and, and out has been helpful in particular. Ernie put, I'd like more experience with publishing in press books so I can help faculty with their OER projects. But this training was so much broader. I'm hoping to come back to this information as my program grows. Great. And Arnie, if you haven't seen it yet, um, there is a summit session on teaching Pressbooks to faculty. 
Um, it's going to be hosted by Lauren Ray at University of Washington. The first session, she is going to take an hour and a half and show how she teaches faculty press books. And at the second session, she's going to talk about the implications for program design from teaching faculty press books and kind of building a program, I think, um, not necessarily backwards, but sort of um, the program that grew out of teaching faculty how to use press books. Uh, Lisa will follow up if OER publishing counts towards faculty promotion at my institution. Um, I'm sure about that. Um, Tina wanted to learn more. Liz wanted to be able to have an informed conversation with instructors about creating and publishing, um, plus ideas about structuring programs. So um, I'm glad that you have some tools to have those conversations. Um, I'd be happy to link to the Pressbook session. I will uh, look that up for you, Amy, in a second. And Laura wanted to add one of the first modules on accessibility and captioning was very helpful, not just for OERs, but in general. And the activity was helpful too. Super. I will let Elle know that that was helpful if um, she's not here with us in this call. So I really appreciate your reflections. It's great to hear um, your takeaways from our time together. And um, as I've mentioned yesterday and, and throughout our time together, um, we don't have to say goodbye. If you would like to continue working in a supportive community on questions around publishing, I invite you to join the co-op. Um, any of you are now eligible to join the co-op if you are working at an allied or institutional member of the OTN. If you are one of um, our consortial members or you're a member of the OTN through a consortia, it's still possible to join the co-op, but it involves a little bit more of a conversation in order to talk about who has access to what. Morgan learned all the parts and roles in creating and publishing a textbook. Great. Thanks, Morgan. Um, the latest link I put in the chat there is uh, the OTN Publishing Cooperative Benefits. So joining the cooperative, to be clear, is really just you saying, I want to keep having these conversations. I want to keep knowing what the opportunities are to learn more. You don't need to commit to any particular funding or any particular OER publishing program. Uh, we really are a community just working on these questions together. There are some benefits to joining the co-op that go beyond uh, people, although that is the best one. Um, in the green part of the table, you can see there are professional development, Pub 101, and other trainings. Um, we have held scribe trainings in the past, press books trainings. Um, community and support is a big part of it. This coming Monday, for example, I will hold our monthly tea time session for the publishing cooperative, which is basically like an open office hours where people come and talk about their projects they're working on, ask for support, ask for questions. And then sometimes um, I might invite somebody to talk very informally about their project and how it's been going to share that experience. We do have a dedicated um, publishing cooperative Google group that I would add you to if you would like to join. And then you're already quite familiar with some of the tools and resources, which include the curriculum, templates, and guides. Um, those are really available to anyone for the common good and the public good. As part of the co-op member, you can access Scribe services if that's ever something you found a need for. Um, there is a 30% discount uh, to Pressbooks. You actually don't need to join the co-op to access that. You just have that as an OTN institutional member. And finally, um, if you are looking for a Pressbooks sandbox and want to do some practice, um, that is something that we can provide you as well. So that's a brief overview of co-op benefits. Um, I'm now going to share a link in the chat if you would like to join. Just put your name here and I will add you to the Google group, as I mentioned. And um, voila, you are a member of the co-op after that. And if there are any questions about um, your membership related to your institutional or consortial membership, um, I will contact you based on what you say in that form. So, we fit a lot into the first 10 minutes. I would now like to hand things over to Amy. Uh, many of you may already know Amy Hoffer. She's the coordinator of the statewide open education library services in Oregon. She's going to talk about next steps after uh, you finish a project, the big moments, 
Um, and then really she's going to be here and, and um, we'll have an open conversation. And at the end, I would like um, to do a couple more things before we say goodbye. So don't go away. And uh, I turn things over to you now, Amy. Okay, thanks, Karen. And thanks so much for having me. Um, and just to check, can everybody see my slides right now? Okay, yes. good. <clears throat> so you're done. Now what? <laughs> I shamelessly cribbed from Amanda's slides and I made an about 80 slide. Um, as Karen mentioned, I'm the OER coordinator for Oregon's higher ed. It's 17 community colleges and seven universities. Um, and I do see a couple of Oregonians here. So hi, and I'm so happy that we are developing a deeper bench of expertise in Oregon on open publishing. Um, it really benefits the whole state for people to be in courses like this one. Um, and I would say that what I have at Open Oregon Educational Resources is an accidental publishing program. And I'll tell you what I mean about that. Um, and I'll talk to you about printing and sharing and please ask questions. I've got my two screens, so I've got the chat window open um, and I can see it and it's totally fine to interrupt with a chat question or a question on your microphone. So, um, let's see. So my accidental publishing program, um, I started my position in 2015 and I did not set out to um, have a publishing program at all. Um, what I had was a grant program. So I was giving faculty grants in order to redesign their courses using open educational resources. And um, then at the end of my pilot year, I was like, oh, we've got these grant deliverables and we need to share them. How are we going to do that? So it was very much follow your nose. Um, and um, kind of a realization that I didn't want to have every grantee have to figure it out for themselves. I wanted to have like one centralized answer that I could give people or at least like some suggestions of what to do at the end of your grant in order to meet the requirement that you share your work. Um, and a grant deliverable could look like a bunch of different things. So um, if you got a grant to adopt OER as is, um, then your deliverable would be, you know, share your adoption on the Open Oregon Resources page. And if you created something new or a revision or a remix, then, um, then we need to think about how to share the work that you created as part of your grant project. Um, so that led me to um, having a Pressbooks EDU account so that I could offer that platform to grantees. Um, I don't push people into Pressbooks particularly. I, um, I describe what it does and I show them examples. Um, and you know, some people are like, yes, this is gonna work for me. And some people are like, I wanna have a nonlinear Google site for my course or you know, whatever, that's fine too. However they wanna share whatever platform they wanna do. Um, and then um, also things that get created as a result of the grant because they're sort of spread across platforms. Um, I do have a folder in OER Commons where I can, um, I, have a, I have a group in OER Commons where I can create a folder for each grant cohort. Um, so, you know, and I, I say all this realizing that like some of it sort of um, sideways to what you've been talking about because um, this is really about OER publishing, but because I was coming at it from a grant perspective and um, the majority of the grants that I give, I really try to get people to adopt as is. It's the lowest cost grant and it's also like kind of the path of least resistance to get people using OER. It's the simplest thing to do. Um, since you have to redesign your course anyway, I wanted to just mention that as, as like one of the deliverables of a grant that comes up. So um, in terms of sharing, um, there are two audiences that I wanna talk about in terms of um, sharing with who. And the first audience is students. 
So how are students going to access their materials? Um, this is, to me, the primary question. Um, and it's an instructional design question. It's a user experience question. It's really specific to the faculty. Um, you know, how, how do they like to do this? Is it that they put a link in their syllabus? Is it that they embed all the content in the learning management system? Do they send their students to an external course site? Um, do they expect the bookstore to provide a link to the thing, right? So, um, especially from the perspective of the grant program, um, where the grant is really to redesign your course using OER, um, students are very much the primary audience. And one of the formats that is really important for students to have is print. So um, there's just so many valid reasons that students need and want print. Um, and what I discovered um, at some point is that access to print on demand is really uneven in Oregon. So um, at some institutions, there's an in-house print shop and, you know, or there might be like a very close relationship with a local printer. Um, at other places, it's like, you know, print copies. I don't know. I have no idea how you would get that. So I did a whole bunch of research. Um, and what I landed on that is working well for me at the moment is to use lulu.com for print on demand. Um, so what's working for me about it is that um, when you upload a PDF to lulu.com, if you only sell on the Lulu marketplace, and don't include an ISBN, you can set your revenue to zero. So students really just pay the cost of the print service plus shipping. Um, if you do a bulk order of 30 or more, you start to see a discount. So like a bookstore manager who's you know, doing a bulk order for inventory could have a discount that compensates for their overhead that they need to charge. Um, Thank you, Karen, lulu.com. Um, and there's a few, um, there's like Ingram and there's Montezuma. I'm, I'm sure that Karen included those options in the curriculum, but um, because I don't directly work with a bookstore manager on a campus, I needed a service that would provide a link for individual purchases and Lulu does that. Um, one wrinkle that I've found is that um, the Lulu price often undersells um, what it costs to print something in-house. And that's led to some good conversations about, you know, hey, those are full-time jobs with benefits. Those are union jobs. Like, what does it mean that we're underselling the in-house print shop? Um, I've done some Thing, and I have not been able to connect with anybody at Lulu that can help me understand why their prices are so low. So that's something that um, I would really like to know more about. You know, like, are they cheap because they have bad labor practices? I don't know the answer. So um, it's why I say, like, this is the solution that's working for me right now. You know, um, if I learn more, my opinion might change, but it has worked well for me, um, you know, to this point. So um, the other audience besides students is everybody else. Um, and I mean, that would be, you know, colleagues in the department, um, colleagues in the discipline who might adopt librarians and others who might recommend that somebody else adopt. Um, the open ed community that wants to know about successful projects. Um, so in terms of sharing with everybody else, that's where um, you want to start to think about like where, where are people going to be able to find um, the work that faculty create. So, um, you know, in Oregon, I'm always directing people to the open Oregon resources page, you know, see what your colleagues are using for the same course number. We have common course numbering. Um, and of course, that's great for Oregonians, but um, in terms of national repositories, um, if something meets the criteria of the Open Textbook Library, um, that is a super important place to have textbooks be. 
Um, I mentioned OER Commons. When faculty are there, um, I always say, you know, caveat that there's a lot of K-12 content here. Please use the drop-down menu to make sure that you're filtering your search results. Um, and then, you know, your institutional repository, any disciplinary repositories. Um, personally, I don't go too wild with it um, because for my purposes, um, I want to have the entry on the Open Oregon Resources page. I want things to be in the Open Textbook Library if they um, meet the criteria. And then I put things in my OER Commons folder so that I can track what has been produced as a result of the grant funding. Um, and then if faculty want to put their stuff somewhere else or if um, somebody at the institution wants to um, put things in other repositories, that's of course fine. Um, and I will just say that for everyone else, um, print is still a pretty important um, option to be able to offer. Um, you know, I've been in meetings with faculty where um, when you hold up the print copy of the book, the light bulb goes off and they're like, oh, it's a textbook, right? So I'm sure that others have had that experience where like, it just doesn't quite click what you're talking about until you show them the physical thing. Um, and having review copies for faculty can be really important. Um, and so for that reason, Open Oregon funding has $500 per institution um, for what we call a petting zoo. So um, each institution can send me a list of OER that they would like print copies of. Um, and I can talk a little bit more about that. It gets, gets a little bit involved because sometimes there isn't like a one-click option for print copies. Um, and Julia is saying in the chat, there are lots of printing options. Lulu, Book Baby, Blurb, Ingram Spark, Ingram Lightning Source, Amazon KDP and even local and commercial book printers might have print on demand options with small minimums. Um, for example, McNaughton and Gunn is a commercial printer, but they can do print on demand with a 25 copy minimum, black and white only. Thank you so much for all of those options. Um, I think it's really different if you're working with a bookstore manager who can help you handle this. Um, you know, for example, Montezuma is um, a print-on-demand option that um, I think seems like a great company and I got like a sample from them, but you do have to be ordering through um, a college or university bookstore. And um, I work from home, not just right now, but sort of in general, I work from home. Um, and so I really can't, I, I don't have any space at my house to have inventory around and I don't really have capacity to like, you know, post boxes of things and then ship them out to people. Um, so having um, a company that takes care of the fulfillment piece the way that Lulu does was one of the priorities for me. Um, but you know, your, your program of course might um, be able to work with a bookstore manager at your institution. Um, Anything else about printing before I go on? Okay, I think I'm almost done with what I have prepared anyway. Um, so um, marketing, um, so again, marketing to who I would say, you know, consider um, who your audience is. Um, one audience that I think is really important, as I mentioned, is the open ed community. Um, my perspective is that I, I personally don't really want to have faculty spending tons of time on search. Um, I would really prefer to have me or another librarian be like, here's the top three, check these out. Let me know if none of them work for you and we'll dig more. Um, so, you know, getting the word out, you know, using the listservs to you know, make announcements. People love to see new publications and congratulate you on them. Um, and it's also a nice way to kind of, um, you know, have it top of mind, remind people sometimes um, something will come across on the listserv that hasn't made it into the open textbook library yet. Um, so I think that that's a really important audience. And then um, for me, and I think I've been sort of like 
sharing my perspective as um, primarily like a, a grant program, but um, my most important audience actually is um, the higher education state agency in Oregon and also the legislature because this is where the funding for my program comes from. And um, so, you know, when I'm marketing to those folks, the thing that they really care about is how much the students save. Um, and of course, you know, student savings is really important and it's also not the end of the story, but it's the number that they care about most. It's the metric that they care about most. Um, so, you know, having the folder in OER Commons where, you know, if they say, hey, where's the stuff that we made this year with that grant money? I can be like, here's the link. Or if they say like, you know, what happened with that grant? I can be like, here's the report on the Open Oregon blog with the information about student savings. Um, so, you know, sort of anticipating that and having it rolled up in a way where you can easily share um, is another kind of wrinkle on marketing. And um, also last week I learned about this really great um, marketing guide that Karen <laughs> mentioned in a different session, and I'm sure that she shared it with you all in the curriculum. Too good not to share. Um, and um, I'm, I'm, I'm actually sure that like the folks with the expertise in this room have really different perspectives on marketing if you're coming at it more as a publishing program. So um, that's kind of my overview on what I wanted to talk about. Um, here's my email address, hopper a at lynnbenson.edu and also on Twitter, open underscore Oregon. Don't forget the underscore um, because there's another group with a similar Twitter handle and they're kind of grumpy. Um, but um, I just wanted to open it up for questions and um, really no question too obvious like you know I just kind of summed it up in 10 minutes or whatever that was but there was so much trial and error and following my nose that went into all of this so I'm happy to answer any question that folks might have um, and Karen just put in the link to the marketing guide and um, also the list of messages is one way that she finds out what books to add Thank and also you. me saying, hey, Karen, can you add this book if somebody wants to write a review of it? <laughs> I really appreciate getting those emails because as you can imagine, I can't be like scouring the internet looking for open textbooks at all moments. So it's really helpful to have those suggestions crowdsourced either through the form in the OTL or a direct email. But I do comb the uh, listservs also for those announcements. So um, please never hesitate to send me suggestions for the library, anybody. Um, thank you, Amy, and I will just echo her invitation uh, to ask Amy anything um, for that matter, since this is our last session together, if you'd like to ask me or your uh, classmates any questions, we can just have a discussion about all things OER. I will also mention that in the previous uh, 101 cohort, Liz Mays from Pressbooks gave a presentation on printing and talked a bit about ISBNs and the setup of you know, how to get a PDF ready for printing. So if that's something you're interested in learning more about, there is a link in our orientation document to Liz's presentation. She has since left Pressbooks and is now teaching full time uh, in Arizona. So I'm waiting to see if any questions come in the chat or if anyone wants to unmute. Yeah, I hope people weren't hoping that I was going to talk about ISBN um, because I only print on Lulu because they let me set to zero and they do the fulfillment piece. Um, I just haven't had to deal with them <laughs> because like in order to have revenue at zero, you specifically need to not um, have ISBNs. And Julie is saying that she can speak about ISBNs. That would be awesome. Oh, and uh, the cat is Wendell. Would you like me to speak briefly about ISBNs? Sure. So ISBNs are international standard book numbers. It's a unique number for every format of every book, but you really only need one if you're selling it in a retail environment. Um, if you're just selling it directly hand to hand or through an online portal that you control, you don't need one. However, having an ISBN allows you to uh, control the metadata that's associated with your book to the book industry. So the way you get an ISBN traditionally 
is by going to Bowker. Bowker is the United States Agency for uh, controlling ISBN numbers. Every country has their own. Um, and once you sign in and register with Bowker, you can purchase ISBNs. You can buy them individually or in bulk, 10, 100, 1,000 or more. Uh, the more you buy, the cheaper they are per ISBN. And ISBNs are not just a book identifier, they're also a publisher identifier. So if you purchase an ISBN through a third party agency to the book industry, they will be the publisher and then you would be like an imprint. So I would, you know, think long term with your ISBNs if you're if you're planning on doing something with them, it is better just to go and buy your own um, rather than go through a, a third party site. So directly from Bowker. Thank you so much. That's great information. Um, and I think that um, this is just one of those examples where OER program goals can be so different. And that is why the results wind up looking so different, you know, um, because I'm really coming at it from um, a grant program perspective. And it's like, okay, I need to be able to share the results of the grant funding. Right, the ISBN piece doesn't become a priority, um, but to look at the totally opposite end of the spectrum, um, an open publishing program like OpenStax, um, their goal is to be a textbook of record for a bunch of high enrollment lower division courses. So they are definitely going to want to have an ISBN and really do everything the way that a traditional commercial publisher does to be very um, parallel as a replacement for those expensive copyrighted textbooks. Um, so yeah, there's, there's so many different flavors in terms of OER publishing and sharing. Any other questions for Amy or anything that you'd like to share with one another? Thanks, Julie, again, for your ISBN and print on demand wisdom. I'm curious if um, if folks have stuff that you're already sharing, like what you're doing now and might what what you might like not be quite satisfied with that you want to improve. Does not apply. I know it's a quiet bunch. <laughs> All right. It is well, right after lunch here in Oregon. I just had tea, same. so you know I have plenty to say. But <laughs> <laughs> nobody else had their tea. Um, Julie says MSU just started an OER program last fall. We have two books in our repository, but more on the way. That is so cool. And Katie says, what was the question? So the question that I was wondering, and Arnie says just getting started, um, is how, like, if you have open content that you're currently sharing, how you're sharing it, and if you want to improve in some way, or like what direction you want to go next. And it sounds like Arnie is saying, like, too soon in the process to say. Yeah, we, we got our... Um... Pressbooks license and, and paid for that, but we, we only have a few people interested in using it. So we sort of go, gone all in with Pressbooks, but I'm not sure if there's the demand to use that. So it's possibly a, on us to do a little more marketing to get the faculty to do that, but uh, we'll see how that goes. You know, um, so when I first got the, Pressbooks account. Um, I like had just met the then library director at Klamath Community College, um, Robin Jeffrey, and she was like, "I'm so sick of the you know composition instructors. They assign this expensive book just to like have the grammar rules." I was an English major. I know what those rules are. That information is in the public domain. So she um, like made a little writing handbook and put an open license on it. And I was like, hey, could that be my guinea pig? Um, so that was how I like learned a little bit about Pressbooks and then learned about, you know, covers and learned about print covers and 
like learned about printing. Like it's really nice if you can find someone with the manuscript and just say like, hey, can I can I use this as my guinea pig? So here's here's Robin's book in print. Um, and and like I said, like I used this to learn the different functions of press books for myself. And um, what's happened since then is that um, like there's no way that I can be that hands on with all of the grantees, but just like starting to have something in press books um, where I could show here's what it is um, was really helpful. So, um, you know, even if maybe you have something earning yourself or one of your colleagues might have something that they'd be willing to have it be the guinea pig manuscript. Um, and Katie's saying that, as I know, <laughs> which I do, um, at Portland State, they're working on improving accessibility of our open textbooks already published and then moving them into press books. Um, we do have some faculty working directly in press books, but in some cases, we create press book instances of our open textbooks because they're easier to edit than a PDF. And um, I am really excited, um, Katie, I hope it's okay to have a spoiler that I'm soon to publish like a really nicely done blog post that Katie wrote about that whole word remediation for accessibility project that she's been doing. Um, and Thanks, Katie, Katie, I don't know if you wanna turn on your mic and talk a little bit more about what you're doing. Yeah, um, so I might have shared this before in Pub 101, but I, I've been working on like a six month contract for Portland State um, with the primary goal of sort of auditing the open textbook collection that already exists. We have a little over, I think, 22 textbooks. And um, in that audit, I've been checking on improving the accessibility of the books one by one and sort of, I've been able to actually improve the accessibility of some books, but in some, my time is coming to an end uh, at, at Portland State on this contract, so I'm giving recommendations for moving forward. So our workflow is kind of like, I work on on improving the accessibility of the source, the original book, usually in Microsoft Word, then move it into a PDF, make sure that looks all nice, and then move it into press books. Because we see the press book instance as way more adaptable and we wanna support that adapt process. Um, and yeah, that blog post, thank you, Amy. It is, uh, it's still <laughs> got some vinyl touches, but hopefully, I just wanted to share like all the knowledge I've learned about, much with help from Elle, who presented on our first meeting, I think, at Pope 101. And when that is published, I'll share it on the listers. Um, and I mean, the idea that Katie is doing an audit with Karen Bjork at Portland State, um, I've also barely started an audit of the open Oregon press books that are in there because it's just kind of like grown into a big jumble and, you know, do the links still work? I don't know, you know, are things as accessible as they could be? I don't know. So um, getting to a point and then doing like some retrospective, like harmonizing of like, do we have standards? What should they be? That kind of thing. Um, Catherine says, They've only used OER Commons for sharing individual faculty works. Faculty like the free Pressbooks site, but just starting to get some support for moving towards open textbooks in Pressbooks. Um, OER Commons was such a good proof of concept for me, um, partly because there's um, someone in the Oregon legislature, I don't know who it is, but there's someone who's really excited about us having an OER repository for Oregon. And I'm like, no, no, we don't need 50 repositories, one per state. Like, let's contribute to the existing repositories that everybody already looks in. Um, so it, it's been a really nice proof of concept. Everything that's in my OER Commons group is also indexed, so it's findable. Um, but more importantly, like because I can make folders, I have a single link to be like, here's everything that came out of this cohort, or here's everything that came out of this sprint or whatever. Um, so, you know, I have found it to be really flexible. I like that it, it can be a referatory where you just put in a link to whatever it is, and it'll accept it and make a record for it. Um, so um, I'm glad that it's working for you also. Um, Morgan says, right now we have several successful journals we publish, but no books as of yet. 
this course has taught me more about the textbook publishing and creation process. We're a small team at my library, and I think encouraging adoption will be the best path for now. If anyone has resources for encouraging adoptions, please share. Um, that's a really good question, and um, I'll let people put it in the chat, but I'll just say that um, the Open Textbook Network review workshop model has been a really effective way to drive adoptions in Oregon for not very much program money per adoption. Because a lot of times when people review an OER for that $200 stipend, they will go on and adopt. So the student savings per dollar spent um, is like the highest ratio of any of the kinds of things that I do with my program money. So I really recommend the OTN um, workshop model. And people do call me and say like, should my consortium join? And I'll be like, yes, here's why I think that. It's almost $20 in student savings per program dollar spent for me at this point. And if anybody has other resources or thoughts about encouraging adoptions, I think that's a good question for the whole group. Thanks so much, Amy, for the discussion. Feel free to post any more questions or interrupt me. I am, before, um, before we go, I'm going to ask for your more formal feedback about Pub 101. I appreciate your reflections in the chat and then also have a quick form to share with you. Um, but before we go, on to that, Amy probably doesn't want to um, stick around. I'm actually going to ask you to use this class time for filling out the survey because I find it works best. Please join me in thanking Amy for joining us and sharing her experiences. Uh, thank you very much, Amy. Look forward to seeing you again soon. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Bye. Farewell. Don't go. Don't go. Oh, I'm still okay. here. Amy can go. Amy, you, oh, okay. <laughs> you, you're, you're free, but I didn't want to use our usual <laughs> that we're leaving, so I didn't want people to be like, see you, bye, which I hope feels it. Okay, hi, everybody. So um, thank you for uh, giving Amy a fond farewell. The link I just put in the chat should be to the Pub 101 survey form. And so since we have a few more minutes together, I would just like you to take this time to go ahead and fill it out. Um, and I will stop talking so that you can do that. And then feel free to just post in the chat when you have finished.